So, you know, one of the one of the interesting phenomena I'd say in the world is the attitude we have towards uh, towards finance, towards financiers. Since day one, uh, or since the last, certainly for the last two thousand years, I can't think of a group that has been demonized more than anybody who has anything to do with money, money changing, money lending, banking, finance, Wall Street, so on. Every crisis is blamed on them. Every problem is blamed on them. Every villain in a movie or in a TV show is usually somebody involved in finance. So certainly a businessman. I think I saw statistics once. The 51% of all the murders committed on television are committed by business leaders, right? Uh, whereas in real life, it's 0.00001% or something, you know, trivial like that. But in television, we need villains and businessmen and primarily financiers are attractive villains. And this is, this is not new. If you go back to uh, uh, Jesus kicking them out of the temple, right? The money changes are kicked out of the temple, they're the bad guys. If you go to Dante, Dante's Inferno, uh, the money lenders, bankers basically, are in the seventh rung of hell. They've got a bag of gold around their neck and the gold is dragging them into the fire, right? It's, it's pulling them down into the fire. They are the bad guys. If, if you've ever read, one of my favorite Shakespeare plays is a play called The Merchant of Venice. Highly recommend it if you can ever see it on stage. There's, a, there's actually a movie with Al Pacino. He plays, he plays Shylock the money lender, the Jewish money lender, and there's a whole angle here about Jews as well in terms of finance. They're always linked historically. And of course Shylock is the bad guy and he's the guy who demands in repayment for a loan a pound of flesh, basically the life of the guy who can't pay him back. So instead of, uh, instead of in a sense, bankruptcy, what you get is a pound of flesh. Uh, and it's a fascinating play. Uh, both in terms of the anti-Semitic aspect of it, but also in terms of the attitude towards finance, the attitude towards money lending, and the way the court system runs in Venice of the I don't know, 1500s or 16th century. Um, you know, in modern times, I don't know, you've probably seen the movie Wall Street. I don't know about if your generation, if that's a big time movie, but uh, for, for us, that was the movie to see. And of course, in Wall Street, the real bad guy is the Wall Street guy, right? And, and if you listen to the movie, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, um, dialogue throughout the movie because the movie from the beginning, the guys who talk finance are talking in terms of warfare, in terms of blood, in terms of machine guns, in terms of everything is about violence. And there's this strong association Generally, I think of capitalism and violence, but certainly of finance and violence. Uh, finance, and the reason is that we perceive finance to be a zero-sum game. War is a, what's war? Zero-sum game, positive-sum game, negative-sum game? What's war? Yeah, it was a negative-sum game, right? Negative-sum game in the sense that you're worse off after than before. You've lost, wealth has been destroyed. Lives, obviously, have been destroyed. It was always a negative sum game. It's always interesting to listen to economists like Paul yeah. Krugman claim that war creates economic activity and it's somehow a good thing, uh, you know, uh, because uh, GDP goes up during war. Do you know why GDP goes up during war? Printing money. Yeah, they're printing money. So GDP measures, uh, measures uh, government spending. So government spending is a positive on, uh, on GDP. So government spending goes through the roof, so GDP goes up. So for example, first year of World War II, GDP in the United States grew, like the US economy supposedly grew by 12%. But if you think about it, what did standard of living do? What did quality of life do? Like it plummeted, right? If you were a man, you were off in the trenches somewhere in, in Europe or in the Pacific, your life sucked. Right? And if, if you're a woman, you were now going to work, and, but you were working in factories to build what? To build machine guns and tanks, which were useless when it comes to actually improving human life. I mean, they're necessary, you have to defend yourself if you're at war, but they're not pro, really, economic growth. So even though GDP goes up, standard of living goes down, 
You always have to watch GDP numbers because they're always tricky in that way because they measure things that are not necessarily correlated with human well-being. So sometimes GDP goes off for the wrong reasons, like during war. So war is a negative sum game, and the and the the attempt is to associate finance, and always has been to associate finance with a negative sum game. The idea is when you enter a financial transaction, everybody loses, or somebody wins, but it's at your expense, and overall society is worse off. That is kind of how finance is presented in, in the movies, in stories, in our popular culture, in, in kind of the, the way we think about the world. And it's, and the two questions one has to ask about this. One, is it true? You know, maybe it's true, maybe finance really is a horrible profession, right? And second, if it's not true, then why do we have this perception of finance? Why do we think of finance, financiers, financial activity, in such negative terms, in such zero sum or even negative sum terms. Because there's something important going on here. And it's not new. As I said, this idea has been going on forever. Uh, you know, money lending, money lenders are always the first guys to, you know, in, in, in olden times to get killed. Uh, you know, and, and uh, they're certainly the ones to be demonized throughout. So first, is it true? Well, it's, it's amazing to me that anybody would consider that it's true, if you look at the world around us. Uh, every business, every business that starts, every business that grows, and we know that businesses are what hire people, so every job that is created is at the end of the day created by, because somebody is willing to invest capital in order to make that business sustainable. So think about what is it, let's take a bank. Bank are the easiest kind of financial markets. What do banks do? What do banks do? Good question. What's that? They give, they give loans. So what does that mean? Who do they primarily give loans to? Who is the primary who gets loans? Businesses. Most of the loans are given out to businesses. There's some to consumers, but most loans are business loans. What do the businesses do with the money? Burn it? Waste it? What do they do with it? Invest. Yeah, they, they grow their plants and equipment, they might buy stuff, they might hire more people. They're using it to run the business, to actually grow the business. I mean, a bank's not going to give you money, not going to lend you money, if you're going to use the money to, to go back bankrupt, because then you can't return it. It's usually because you're going to invest that money in a way that makes a return from which you can return the money to the bank. So bank loans are one of the few ways in which the economy grows, by growing businesses. By growing, and businesses growing means employment is growing. And the banks loan money to all businesses. Anybody who walks into the bank, hey, I need a loan, I need to grow my business, do they all get it? No. No. What, what is the criteria by which a bank decides whether to give a loan or not to give a loan? Why would you give one guy a loan and another guy no? Yeah. Creditworthiness. Yeah, creditworthiness. And what's the creditworthiness, particularly on the business side, based on? Your ability to actually do something with the money, right? Do something useful with the money. Actually produce, actually employ more people, actually grow the business. So on the on the loan giving side, not only are they giving loans to businesses, but they're giving loans to the businesses that based on their judgment are the best businesses. If you're a lousy business, if you're going to do, if you're going to basically waste the money, if you're not going to be successfully investing in it, the bank is going to try not to give you that money. Right? So the bank does two things. One, it provides financing, but second, and I would say much more important, it discriminates. It decides who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Who's going to actually be a good business person? Who's not going to be a good business person? Think about venture capital. Does everybody get venture capital in Silicon Valley? You have an idea, you just walk into, you know, Sequoia Capital or Klein and Perkins, and they just write you a check, right? No, they're selective on the basis of the same thing a bank is. Right? Slightly different business, but same idea. They decide 
who, who is worthy, who has a good idea, who can actually generate probably profits, who's going to employ, who's going to build, who's going to grow a business, and who is not. So capital is not wasted, it's put efficiently deployed to productive activities. Which is hard. It's hard to decide what's going to be successful and what's not. Very few venture capitalists are good at what they do. Banking is a little easier, but even in banking, some of those loans, particularly if there's a recession, you know, don't get paid back. And you get rewarded, i.e. in profit as a bank, if you are good at it. And you get penalized and ultimately go bankrupt if you are bad at it. So there's a self-reinforcing system which makes sure that the best people at allocating capital, at deciding who deserves capital, who's good at deploying capital, who's not, they rise to the top. They're the ones who are successful. Now that's one thing, one thing Bank says, yeah. So you would regard <coughs> bailouts of certain financial businesses as interfering with the mechanism that's determining who is to succeed in Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bailouts are a way for the government to say, you don't have to be responsible anymore. You don't have to think too hard about how you're going to get the money back or who's a good investment and who's a bad investment. Indeed, you can take on massive amounts of risk, which is often associated with high, at least short-term returns, because on the upside you get to benefit and on the downside we bail you up. So don't worry. Don't do your job. Don't think about what you actually need to do because we'll bail you up no matter what. So I think bailouts are unbelievably destructive to the ability of a bank or ability of any financial institution to do their job properly and to get penalized when they do their job badly. And therefore, if one bank, right, if one bank is doing badly, you know, if one bank is doing badly during a financial crisis or whatever, and therefore is, is about to go bankrupt, and another bank hasn't done badly, has actually did a good job during this period and is doing okay, when you bail out the bad bank, you're doing two things. One, you're rewarding vice. You're rewarding, or at least, you're rewarding incompetence. Right? And, you're, and you're saying incompetence is okay, and you're penalizing the good bank. Why are you penalizing the good bank? What would happen if the, if the bad bank goes bankrupt? The good bank would take their customers. They would grow. Right? But now, They've got competition, which is funded by government funds, which is funded by a bailout, not funded by a market, not funded because this other bank is really a competitor. So you're penalizing the ability of the good bank to expand, to grow, to, 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 and therefore you're actually expanding incompetence in the economy. And, and what, they did, what they did in uh, 2008 during the, the bailout of the banks is just horrific in terms of its consequences for financial institutions in the United States, in terms of uh, you know, how we see banking and what, how banks can function. Because the good guys got penalized and the bad guys got rewarded. And when you create that kind of incentive structure, you're just asking for more trouble. You're asking for more crises. You're asking for bad investments and bad allocation of capital, which is, I think, why we got such slow economic growth post-crisis, one of the reasons, and why I think the next crisis is very likely to be worse than the previous crisis, because we're building up this bad, you know, these bad investments, these bad uh, incentive structures. But yeah, bailouts are a distortion to a, a healthy market process of correcting for bad behavior and rewarding good behavior. Rewarding, I know banks, they came into the financial crisis during the financial crisis, never had a losing quarter, made money every single quarter. They had no financial problems. And if they were forced to take top, the, the bailout money, they were forced to pay it back to the government with, with an interest, so the government made money off of it. And they couldn't expand their business because the banks they would have liked to have, you know, actually taken business from were bailed out. They also got the same kind of top money. The government treated good banks and bad banks exactly the same. 
If you treat good kids and bad kids exactly the same, there's going to be problems as they grow up. There's going to be problems. So having a healthy financial market on the on that side, on the side of deciding who gets the money and who doesn't, is crucial. Because it is what spurs economic growth, it's what rewards good companies, encourages them to grow, it's what holds back bad companies and encourages them to shrink. 